again, I guess first and foremost, I wanted to thank you for taking time to, uh, in your busy schedule. Um, we haven't really spoken consistently since the pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, Josh McCumber, uh, professional golfer, coach, uh, collegiate All-American. Help us understand just from a life standpoint, where you first started your interest in golf. Talk to me about the first time you put a club in your hand, what that experience was like for you. How did golf become so infused into the McCumber family tree? Sure. So I was very, very young. I've grown up around it my entire life. My dad and his brothers grew up on a golf course. They grew up on a Donald Ross public golf course in Jacksonville, Florida. Their parents did not play golf, but when they had three boys at the time, they ended up moving to the 14th hole at the Hyde Park Golf Course. And Hyde Park has a little history. That's where Ben Hogan made an 11 on a par three there back in the old Jacksonville Open. But my, you know, it's like my grandparents just figured this might be a good place for the raise of boys. There was a cross the street from a golf course. When they were young, they went over. My grandfather took them to meet the pro. And they said, okay, no problem. We'll kind of put these kids to work. They can pick crabgrass in the morning and then we'll let them play golf in the afternoon. And they learned to play golf. And from that, I guess, love and start when they were young players, it kind of grew into where my family got into the golf business. My dad, my dad started a golf company. He's the oldest of the brother, McCumber brothers. And then Mark, his younger brother, ended up playing the PGA Tour winning 10 times. So I grew up, was born in 1976. Mark's first win was 1979. So I grew up around the Goff family, the McCumber Goff family. My dad brought clubs home to me. I think I was four years old. I can remember clear as day, the house we lived in, he came home with like a cut down five iron and a putter and said, here you go. And, you know, I don't really remember a time much before that. And so I would just sort of tag along with my dad at the golf course. Obviously, he had a background of playing golf. And now in a golf business, we were living on a golf course that was designed and developed by my family. And that is kind of where it started. And then it's just kind of gone from there. My uncle was playing the tour. He lived at the Ravines, which was in Middleburg, Florida, all the way until 1988. So I grew up until I was 12 years old with him living there. And then he only moved, you know, about an hour away to the beach, Ponte Vedra which is the home of the players and a golf course out there. And that allowed him to practice and have access and, and kind of be close to that facility. And so I just grew up around the game and around great players that were trying to make it playing, that were coming to the ravines, playing with my uncle. Uh, so I had some very solid teachers, some great mentors to observe and watch. And that was kind of my life. Yeah, I can imagine that being quite the advantage. What was that like for you growing up around that? type of talent, like having that ingrained in you since you were really born? Yeah, it was really awesome because, you know, I had a lot of people around me that really knew the game well. Obviously, my uncle was an extremely solid player that was successful out on tour. Uh, my dad knew a lot about the game. They would tell stories from all of the players that were sort of like Mark's mentors. He, he grew up playing at Hyde Park and really a, an older player named Dan Sykes kind of took Mark under his wing. So there was a teacher out there at Hyde Park. His name was Nelson Lee. So I heard all these like old story of like what the old players would tell Mark, you know, my dad had stories from the locker rooms and what they would say about playing. And so I just got to experience it from the really from the playing level at a very high level, right. From watching my uncle play tournaments on tour and being around all the players of, of his generation. So that was extremely helpful for me. And then there were younger mini tour players or guys that were trying to make it that obviously looked up to Mark and they were playing a lot of golf at the ravine. So I got to hang out with them and hit balls on the range with them and kind of watch them try to make it right. Watch them put the work in to make it. And some of them did get PGA tour status. They weren't as successful as my uncle, but they got very, very close and won on mini tours. So I really was around guys that were doing what you had to do to attempt to make it at the highest of levels. Josh, when you think about um, the extent of training that goes on in today's world, um, there's so many different angles that coaches take. Um, whatever the sport is, um, there is an emphasis of mechanics. There's an emphasis of uh, functionality, range of motion. 
it's all about the physical body. And, you know, we, we, we put our podcast together and called it the head game for a reason. You know, there's a head game that, that all athletes play, um, whatever level they're competing. And I think people like yourself who have competed at the very highest level in their craft have that much more of an appreciation of the head game that is so very, very real. So let's just kind of go back for a moment. You and I have had a lot of conversations. We've, we've spoken for uh, uh, well over a year now about the, the mental uh, fitness, really, that's required for anyone to compete uh, at a high level. When did you first get introduced to uh, the concept of mental fitness? Uh, what was that like for you? And, and what really allowed you to dig your heels in? Sure. I was, again, very blessed being raised the way I was, watching my uncle play at the highest level. He was uh, taught by a man named Bert Yancey. Started, he went to work with him in the mid-80s, and Bert was extremely intelligent. He was really big on the pre-shot routine. So from a very young age, I understood the value of having a great pre-shot routine and kind of what that meant, you know, kind of approaching the golf ball in a certain way and visualizing the shot and having the way you did it and having your routine kind of help you get set up for the shot. So I at an early stage realized the value of that and sort of the mental game. I felt like as a young player, I had a strength in how I conducted myself on the golf course. Again, my dad seeing lots of players, it was, it kind of put in me early on, you handle yourself well, you know, no throwing clubs. I mean, you whole have composure. I, I was very fortunate to learn a little bit about that. I also had a background in music. My mom's a concert pianist. I grew up having to play piano and instruments when we kind of transitioned to string instruments, the violin and viola. So kind of having that element also helped me with the discipline to practice and understanding kind of breathing and performing. So that was all extremely helpful for me. I would say when I really dove into more of the granular details of the mind and the mental game and understanding is as I was starting to compete in post-college, during college, I would talk with some sports psychologists. I talked with some different people, very, very helpful. When I was playing, did some different things, read some different books. I've always been books. I've always been a learner where I think it took to another level is when I went back to the University of Florida. I think we've had this conversation, Lee, where I got exposed to yoga and meditation. And that kind of took me down a more, a little bit more of a different path of the value of learning to meditate, learning to breathe, centering oneself and the application that I can make with that on the golf course. So that started to shape a little bit more how I looked at it. And so I really took to that, really helped me tremendously. And when I was coaching at Florida, I decided to go back and play again and had some of my best success as a professional after that point in time. And so from that standpoint, I've just kind of dove into all the aspects of performance as it relates to the importance and the value of breathing and just meditating off the golf course and how that helps with the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and just all those things that are so valuable. Cause you mentioned it before about this game and the body performing optimally Obviously, the head is involved in all of that because I'm a big believer. It's all connected, a holistic approach. But when your body truly is in golf, that's your office, right? It's like it's your temple. We got to do all things to help take care of it properly from, you know, the physio to the health and wellness to how it's performing physically, mentally, all those things. It's all it's all intertwined. Yeah, it really gets me thinking and it really shows kind of to the level that you've been really incorporating it into your language and to the way that you're speaking, you're talking parasympathetic, sympathetic, right, right up our alley uh, and knowing those stuff and knowing the advantage of that. A lot of times when we work with athletes, it's difficult. And I'm wondering in your life too, what is that educational gap for people to understand? Uh, we talk with a lot of athletes and ask them, is the mind important? And almost all of them say yes. But then I ask, how often are you training that? Almost all of them say almost none, at least intentionally. So what kind of gaps are you finding in the athletes that you may be working with, the golfers, um, and the level of education that you have to bring to them to kind of bridge that gap of understanding the mind? Sure. I mean, there's, there is a big gap. Players 
kind of heard about it, but they don't really truly know how to breathe. When you start to ask them, do you know what deep abdominal breathing is? They've maybe heard of it. Uh, all different levels of players. I mean, I example, this morning I had a lesson with the guy that I was helping him with something on his breathing and he wasn't really sure how to do it. And so we kind of talked a little bit about it, you know, what you do and the inhale and the exhale and talking a lot about breathing through the nose. And so a lot of people just don't quite understand that they've heard of it. I mean, they've maybe heard, oh, you need to take a deep breath, but they're not even doing that correctly. They're probably doing that before they hit a golf shot that's creating more fight or flight response, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I've really looked at it from my perspective that it's just a basic understanding of maybe getting them into like a standing Zen and putting their hands on their, on their belly and just getting them to feel their belly expanding on the inhale and contracting on the exhale through their nose, slowing that down and getting them to do that. And I've been big on, to me, it's more important them doing that before they get over the ball or before they even start their routine. To me, it's they need to do it when they're pulling up the tee, when they're waiting to tee off, when they're driving to the golf course, just getting them lowering everything because your adrenaline's going to be pumping, man, when you go play, mm -hmm. especially when it matters for something. I mean, you want to mm -hmm. do well. You know, golf is very unique in that every shot you hit is like you're on stage, right? Whether you're whoever you're playing with. So you got to do things leading up to it. So that's a big part of me is just educating them and teaching them the proper way to breathe, the proper way to do things. That's why I love what you guys are doing and love some of your things Lee, because it's extremely measurable. And I, I look forward to exploring and, and having more um, knowledge and education on it, because that to me is the hardest thing with this, right? Is that it's really hard to measure. It's kind of like you're out there and you're grasping at air, you're, you're kind of hugging fog, but there's so much value in, in doing it and how it sort of controls just your mood, it controls your energy level, controls your arousal level, which is everything in golf. I mean, you got to be, you got to be able to manage that to be at your best. Josh, golf is one of those very few sports that a mental coach is more acceptable. There's, there's only a handful of sports. And I think it's because when you look at the sport of golf, as you say, every shot you're on stage, what we like to say at mindful athlete training is life is a performance. So if you think about the, the 18 holes of golf over the course of four days, those are individual snapshots of performance. Why is it that you think in your experience, while there is a gap and, and our job in large part is to try to build that bridge to shorten that gap. But why do you think that golf is one of those few sports that actually embraces the role of the mental, you know, you hear about, uh, certain players who might, uh, you know, call someone in on Sunday at the masters, mm -hmm. you know, that makes a little blurb in SI or the AP sure. wire of who did this or, or, or how someone responded to uh, a collapse when they were in the lead. You know, we've read about those stories. Mm -hmm. Why do you think mental is one of the, excuse me, golf is one of those few sports that mental really seems to fit. Yeah, you know, I, I believe it's because it is such a, mental endeavor i mean it becomes swinging the golf clubs becomes a you know kind of like a, it's a it's like riding a bike like it's an overlearned skill right you know how to do it it's easy to get very very technical and kind of like in your head so i think that there's been some very successful players more in the modern time that have admitted to working with someone that's helping them with that part of the game right they were wanting to find that place that would be called the zone or being in a flow state where they just felt like things were easy. I mean, they didn't have to think a whole lot, right? Things seemed to slow down. So I think there's players that are trying to find that level and hit the peak performance said, man, I got to figure this out. How can I be in this space a lot more? So they've leaned on people that have knowledge in the sports psychology world. And so Bob Rotella is someone that comes to mind that's had a lot of popularity in writing some books and kind of bringing his sports background and having a ton of knowledge in in back from the basketball side and really kind of diving in and working with some good players. And then from there, it's kind of created like a little cottage industry of sports psychologists that are specializing in golf to help players with their mental aspect. I just think that players look at it and know it is. I mean, everybody understands that it's a, uh, it, there's just, it's just, it's a monster part of it is your mental approach, how you pro apply everything, how you practice, how you get ready. It's obviously a big part of performance. So I, I believe it's just that way because people realize it. I guess the final piece would be 
most other sports are reactionary. Golf is a sport that the ball's sitting there. We deliver the contact. So it's just a sport that you need techniques, you need to understand certain principles to help make it a little more reactionary, to help make the golfer a little more athletic when he's doing it. Because we know that the more that he can react to something and the more that he can just play athletically, trust his ability, trust his unconscious, he's going to do better. So I think all of those factors make it very acceptable because now – the best players in the world are using someone in some form or fashion to help them with that part of the game. It gets me thinking about the happy Gilmore, happy place or ledger of bagger, uh, the legend of bagger Vance, like everything is just kind of, uh, fading away. It's just you and the ball. Um, have you ever had a moment like that for yourself in terms of your playing or have you witnessed it and just seen a player just play, uh, like nothing else is there. It's just him and the ball in the course. You know, I have had some of those moments in time where you're just sort of uh, in this sort of like space where not a lot's going on. Your rhythm feels amazing. The ball's coming off unbelievably solid and you're not really having to try real hard, right? It's just sort of happening. I've been fortunate to have that happen a few times in a tournament round of golf in some you know, qualifying types of rounds. Also watching some other players, you'll see it. You'll see a guy, I mean, I've played golf with, I've, this comes to mind. I'm at Q School, George McNeil, who plays the tour now. He had been a very good player, was working at a golf club and had qualified for the U.S. Open the year before. And he's rolling at Q School, playing great. And he shot the easiest 64 that I think I've ever seen. And you could just see it just was easy. It was just no nonsense, driving it great, putting well. And you could just tell it was going easy. And he rolled through Q school that year. He was in a great space. He might've, he won, I think first and second stage and finished second at finals or might've won finals. It just was, he was in that space. It was cool to see. I remember looking at my caddy going, man, is it easy for him right now? I think that's what it looks like, right? For good players, it just looks easy. And I think the biggest thing you see too, when that's happening is they're pretty unflappable. Nothing seems to really bother them because he didn't ever shot perfect that day. I mean, a lot of great ones, but if something was a little off, it was no big deal, right? You just go on to the next shot. If you miss the putt, you tap in, you go get this bunker shot up and down and you move on your merry way. I think to me, that's what I've noticed from kind of studying it now, being on the coaching side and really looking at it, thinking back on my career and helping my cousin Tyler. It's, it's the ones that are really in that space seem really, really unflappable and they seem to deal with the, the not so good shots or the bad breaks. Like it was just par for the course. Hmm. Josh, you mentioned Tyler. And uh, I know that when we last spoke pre pandemic, um, you were working with him. You were, you were caddying for him. Yes. Um, talk to me a little bit about what that was like for you after your own career. Uh, I, I believe you, you had two U S open appearances mm -hmm. um, and making that transition to caddy family uh, what that dynamic was like for you. And then really the help us peer in a little bit. I, I think so many people listening um, had interest in what it's like to be that close to watching someone perform at a high level, but sure. your, your perspective that much more uniquely. So you were once that person. Now yeah. you're not swinging the club. You're, you know, they're in a different role. What, what was that like for you? You know, it was, a, it was a great opportunity for me to have. I had to make some sacrifices to be able to do it. My family and everyone was very supportive. I really felt a very strong pull when he got his Corn Ferry Tour status after he was the, the, the top uh, points winner, money winner on the McKenzie Tour, PGA Tour Canada in 2018. And I just felt like we were talking and he's like, who do you think I should get to caddy for me? And he would kind of made a, a comment about me. I'd love for you to do it, but I know you can't. And I said, well, maybe I can. Because I really felt, I knew how good he was, that I wanted to be there to help him get to the PGA Tour. I didn't want him spending any more than a year on the Corn Ferry Tour. And so I was able to do it and was able to be there up close and personal to help him. He had a lot of success early, had a little tough part in the middle of the season and then finished strong to, to get his tour card. And then I caddied for him for about nine events to the start of the PGA Tour. And you just really see that there is no magic with these other players. There is nothing that they're doing extremely better than the others. 
they just seem to really understand their game, right? They manage themselves unbelievably well. They understand scoring. They understand where you have to hit shots. They understand that, you know, there's a time to be aggressive. There's a time to play smart. They just understand all of that. They understand the, the, the most proper way to conserve energy and how they navigate themselves through that week on tour, because there's a lot coming at you when you're playing the PGA tour. So to get to see that up close and personal on a week to week basis was great to be able to do what I could do to help Tyler just focus on playing was fabulous to have great conversations with him after the round about things that were going on in the round that he could work on to do a little bit better from sort of just the approach to course management to, to what he was doing in his game, how his prep was that week, things that he did when it was well, sort of the ultimate competitor mindset, which he's big on being that. So just being there up close and personal was, was great. Again, it was different being obviously on my side because I had a lot less control. It was just more about, you know, getting great yardages, helping him be decisive. And then, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of self-reflection too. My, my default was a player. So I had to work extremely hard to think steps ahead for what a player wants of a caddy. Because mm -hmm. when you're a player, you have the caddy to ask. So when we would get in sort of more like pressure situations, I guess you could say, where he's trying to make a cut, I had to really make sure I'm thinking of those things. I'd have the caddy to ask, right? So my default would be that. It was funny. There would be times where I just would hand him a head cover or something. He'd go, what are you doing? <laughs> it just was funny, right? And I've, I've caddied for another player that I've coached and mentored, and that's what would happen. I would just be laughing when it would happen, right? It's just instincts, right? You played golf your, your whole life and done it. But it was really, really fun to be there and challenge myself to, to be a better caddy and to, to think about those things that he would want and, and would want and have. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, when you think back to it, it is golf. It's just a matter, man, of being comfortable in those venues, in those environments, knowing those golf courses, and really just having a, a confidence in yourself that you've got enough if you can just stay the course and do what you do well. I mean, really just focus on, okay, be Josh McCumber, be Tyler McCumber, you know, be whoever the player is and just be that best player. You're going to have a good chance to be successful out there the caddy plays a lot of the mental role, right? Almost like the core psychologist for the player. What has that been like for you incorporating that mental side that you have kind of now really embraced uh, as a kind of the, you know, the associate, the caddy in that role, the kind of the core psychologist, if you will. Yeah, no, that's kind of what, what, what caddies become, you know, maybe saying a joke at the right time and, and lightening the mood or kind of saying something to, to pick them up or, or saying something kind of firm or stern when they need to hear it. Um, you know, there's a little bit of everything kind of happens in that role. And so it's, it's kind of fun. And then, and then understanding your player and being in enough situations to understand what works maybe for that player and what doesn't work for that player. And so, you know, that aspect has been good. And, and, it, and to me, what the best are is how they implement what they want the player to do. Right. Sometimes it's not a direct approach. Sometimes it's an indirect approach to get them, to sort of back in that that proper headspace, and so I think that's a game in and of itself. Is okay. How do if I if I think he's going too fast? How do we slow him down? Right. It's not just oh you need to slow down. You need to relax. How do you how do you find a way to kind of do that? Right. Um, and so that's that's that in itself is an art to figure that out to kind of get the player to kind of get in that that back in that better spot because it's very easy to happen. Things happen. Bad shots happen. You go round of miss live out some putts you make a bogey you you know something is out of your control you hit a good shot a gust of wind comes you misjudge the wind a ball goes in the water you make a double bogey how do we get back in the moment and just hit shots so all of that is is a is a big part of it and you know just being there and I think at the end of the day the best thing that a caddy can do is help his player feel good about his strategy, feel good about the club he's got and help him be as decisive as possible. Josh, one of the phrases that we use with our athletes is know yourself. And what you mentioned earlier, it, it, we take a, a very unique point of difference uh, to our strategy that allows us to quantify the relationship between someone's ability to manage stress, their, their focal clarity, the timing of their muscles. We call that integration effect. 
that when an athlete is integrated, all of their systems are operating in unison. It's more of that, um, to, to speak to your world a little bit of the, the violin and the viola, it's not individual instruments that are being played, it's the orchestration to create music. So sure. that mind, that mind body music, you actually speak of that uh, as an instructor. Your point of difference is that you are a big mind body approach uh, individual. Um, what is it about, in your opinion, the game of golf? Um, you said, hey, be Tyler Becumber. What is it that you think that golf allows some of these players to do to really get to know themselves through the course of practice, uh, rehearsal, uh, or even working with uh, a mental fitness expert? Yeah, you know, when you're at that high of a level, striving for peak performance, and your body operating at an optimal level, right? Mentally, physically, all those things. You're also, man, by yourself. There's no one else to pass the ball to. There's no one else that can hit the shot for you. Yes, you might have a caddy out there that can help, but he's carrying the clubs, and, and he's not at that moment, unless he's got ESP, feeling exactly what you're feeling, and he can pick up on some energy. But you have a lot of time by yourself. When you travel and play golf, man, you better be comfortable being by yourself. You better be comfortable going to a hotel room in a new city. You're not always going to be able to have someone with you. And this pandemic with COVID and the way when the tour cropped back up where no one can really be with the players, I mean, it, it was weird, right? Felt the towns were shut down still. Nothing was open. I went, I, I went back out on the road last summer with Tyler and helped him. And it had a little bit of an eerie kind of a feel. So you just are with yourself. And so you really have to get to know yourself. And you really are forced to kind of understand what's best for you, what makes you tick, what you like what you can find in the game of golf when you're out there for all those hours that, that you can find enjoyable about it and having the proper perspective. But I think that's what makes golf so special that way is that it's you, the golf ball in nature. And I think that the more that players can kind of embrace that aspect to really know themselves, almost look at it like this is like a spiritual exercise for them, right? On their growth in life. I mean, I love how you talk about that, you know, life is a performance. I mean, this is sort of a chance to really get to do that and, and, and be better. And that's how I've always looked at understanding the mental game and learning to meditate and all of those things. Cause wow, when I would feel a little bit like funky about my game or something like, man, at least I'm getting to really learn some skills here that are going to help me for the rest of my life. And I get to do this, right? I heard some quote one time. Then there's a guy, I love his little podcast. His name is Jim, Jim Quick. And he's got these uh, little short little podcasts, 10 to like 15 minutes. He's a, he's a kind of a memory guy, helps you like really kind of expand your mind and learn tricks to memorize things. And he's just really expanded from there. But he says, you know, change got to, to get to. And I just think back to like playing golf and when you're out there and when players get frustrated, that's such a great perspective to have, man. I'm, 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 I get to be in nature, right? I get to have good snacks on the golf course. I get to focus on my breathing between shots. I mean, when you're a golfer and you want to reach peak performance, you're getting to do all these things that are so amazing for your body, amazing for wellness, right? Taking care of yourself, having a good morning routine, you know, doing things where you're stretching. I mean, all these things are just so good for just the human body. You know, to me, that's, that is kind of what happens to players. I think there's been much, you know, all the, the new school approach is less. I'm going to go, you know, drink some, uh, you know, drinks in the clubhouse. When I finish guys now are probably not drinking much alcohol during the week of a tournament. You know, if they do, it might be a beer if they had a rough day to take the edge off. I mean, more guys are, I'm going to get my rest. I'm going to get in the gym. I'm going to do some, you know, some light stuff. Maybe once the tournament started, I mean, they're really paying attention to all those things because they know that helps their performance. So just by that factor and that aspect, they're getting to know themselves so much better at such a finer, finer level. Yeah, you're talking about some of the things that the guys are doing and the women are doing as well. Um, what are they implementing in terms of the mind that you may have seen on the tour? Are they working on that intentionally? Are they just talking to sports psychologists is there anything that they're really kind of identifying this? Okay, I'll stretch today, you know, maybe, you know, get an extra session in, uh, do some, you know, stim, whatever it may be. But are they doing anything particularly for the mind that's maybe a little bit different? 
I think the ones that understand it and do it the best have sort of their version of meditation, whether it's some progressive relaxation, whether they get themselves real quiet and kind of put themselves in a hypnotic state, they're visualizing themselves playing and coming down the stretch with the chance to win a golf tournament. They're maybe visualizing certain holes on the golf course from a game plan perspective that they want to do. I think the best ones understand the value in doing that and practicing that helps them. I mean, players for the for all of time have talked about it a little bit doing it. I know Jack Nicholas was sort of a, was one of the best. He would talk about his visualization techniques and strategies and play in the holes at night. I think the ones that are the best and get it are focusing on their breathing. They understand how to get themselves um, more relaxed and less aroused. And then when they're in that state, that's when they'll visualize themselves playing the golf course. Mm -hmm. They'll visualize themselves working on something in their swing that they want to do. I think that the best ones are doing that. Those are the types of things that I hear uh, players doing. I know that there are some players I've seen uh, doing some of the stuff, Lee, that you guys are doing, where they can kind of challenge themselves mentally with pressing different things and kind of how their reaction is. And, and that's why I look forward to learning more and actually experiencing some of your stuff. But that, to me, on a, on a small level, that's what players are doing. And then the biggest thing that players work on from a mental standpoint is working on a routine and athletic shot process that helps them go from the left brain thinker into the right brain creative guy to hit the shots, right? So they're doing the stuff at back, they're getting relaxed, but then the best ones are working with a routine and athletic shot process that helps them be able to, okay, I've done my calculations. I've picked the club. I know the yardage. I know where I want to be now. How can I get where I really feel the shot and see the shot and commit to it from more of a creative place. Those are the ones that work hard on that. And that takes a lot of discipline to do that because it's easy just on the range to want to just hit another ball and be thinking about mechanics, but the ones that are the best have the ability to kind of go into that mode picture themselves hitting shots, use their imagination to play golf shots and different golf holes. So that way, when they get on the golf course, it's not foreign. Uh, mm. That's one thing interesting thing about golf is that we learn to play golf on a driving range, flat lies, big open range. We're working on technique and you have to be really disciplined to make sure you sort of segue and practice what it's like to hit golf shots, changing targets, trying to find different lies, changing up clubs and going through the mental approach. The other piece, too, to that is the ability to practice accepting the outcome. So guys that are doing it the best are practicing going through all of that and, okay, that's just where it went, feeling what that feels like if it wasn't maybe the perfect shot. So those are the things that I've seen that the best ones are sort of naturally doing, and they've had whether they've been able to had a great mentor and a parent or a father or someone that helped them or a coach or a sports psychology psychologist that helps them with that. So those are the pieces that I see as it relates to golf and working on your mental uh, acuity. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, Josh, when, when, I, when I hear you talk, um, I hearken back to uh, the movie Point Break with uh, Patrick Swayze. If you, if you remember, that was a big surfing movie. You and I are a little bit older. That's a little bit more of our, of our genre. Sure, but the, the character that he played was Bodhi, and he was a very spiritual guy who was very much into the relationship between himself and the ocean, sure. uh, the energy from it. And, and you mentioned the spiritual transition almost that sometimes people go through. And now you're talking about left brain, right brain, and working more on the acceptance. Um, the language that we use that encapsulates that is chaos. Yeah. And the, the chaos is the, the unexpected gust of wind yeah. that leads to the double bogey. And our point of difference so often with the athletes that we work with is embracing the chaos and training in it. So yes. that point of discomfort now becomes more familiar, right? And that's really the crossover that you're talking about that I'm hearing you talk about. Mm -hmm. And you say it, you know, very eloquently when you speak of, okay, I, I know the distance, I've got my club. I know the shot that I want to take, how I want to execute. It's almost as if you're closing one door and then opening another to that right brain, visual, spatial, creative space sure. of yes. almost being an artist 
Yeah. When you see you, when you see when I see some of the most phenomenal golf shots that I've seen, it's 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 uh, it's a visual poetry of sorts. Sure. You spoke earlier of the effortless nature in which you watch golfers play, but now it's also that that mental, emotional, that mind body connection that's so harmonic yes. that it's a crossover to watch. Um, when I just bring that to your attention, I see you kind of nodding. What kind what comes to mind when I say that to you? No, I just love hearing you talk about that because I think that's the the thing that can be probably can help golfers a lot more is, is, is using what you guys have, are doing with athletes and training them in this chaos, right? Training you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You hear people talking about that. It's not easy to train in that mode, right? That's a, that's a, how do you do that? Right. And so I, that's why I'm nodding because I love that. You're absolutely right. It's, it's being able to deal with the chaos and the best players use the chaos or the adversity that comes as a cue to get back into what they can control, right? To making sure that the next shot, my routine is going to be even a little better. I'm going to commit a little bit more. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make sure that I really feel that shot. I maybe didn't do it quite as well in the last one, or I got a little bit distracted and never really saw my target. I didn't really see the shot that I want to hit. I mean, it happens so much with players where you're, you got a lot going on, and it takes a lot of discipline to make sure that your, your mind stays focused on the things that are going to help you. I mean, just a lot of stuff pops in your head. And so when something bad happens, that's a great opportunity to use that as a cue to, which I work with my players on, to walk confidently to the next shot, right? To, to have your things being carefree between shots, using the chaos, using the adversity, right? To kind of get you back at some of your mental goals that you know are going to help you succeed. So that's why I'm just nodding because I love hearing that. And I love, and that's why I look forward to talking more with you and, and our relationship continuing to build to, to see more about what you guys do and how you help people in this chaos state training in chaos where they get more comfortable in it because that is real life. And that's playing the game of golf is you're going to have things happen that you don't always, you know, expect you need to prepare for those things. But when they happen, okay, how do I deal with it? How do I be able to kind of pull myself out of it when it, the result's not right? And, and kind of continue to get back in my, that sort of uh, space where I feel like it's effortless, where I'm able just to hit shots and react and enjoy the game. Right. I think about my favorite, one of my favorite holes in golf, but as a chaos creator, it's hole 16, Phoenix Open right? Stadium surround, you got people cheering, drinking, all the good stuff, right? The things that you don't typically see sure. uh, at golf. And I think that is one of the most chaotic uh, shots. Uh, I was watching the, the Tiger special and how his dad used to jink and like kind of move change around behind him as he was about to play. Um, and I think that's a, so rare in terms of how people practice. Uh, they typically look for that ideal scenario, ideal situation calm, quiet, no talking in my backswing, mm -hmm. um, where I think chaos is inviting it, inviting people to talk in your backswing, if you will, inviting the, you know, to pump up the crowd. We were watching, uh, I think it was in 2016 or 17, Ricky Fowler and Jordan Spieth and, and Jordan Spieth kind of hits it. He gets it on the green, but not as close as he wants. And then Ricky Fowler like pumps up the crowd and hits it within like 10 feet or eight feet. And, uh, I think it's just an interesting dynamic of people who embrace that moment for themselves. You have to, you have to find a way to embrace that. I know that when Tyler played at the players as a rookie, this was a couple of weeks ago, you know, he's from, that's his home course. Dad won the 1988 players. Hmm. You know, the family was there. They're letting spectators come back, even though it was limited, you know, the family was going to be there. We're all trying to get tickets you know, there's inherently, you're going to feel like, man, like this is my first players, the big tournament, my big tournament, my big field, you know, it's considered the fifth major. I want to do well. You're obviously going to have pressure, just natural pressure, right. To do well, everybody's there. And my messaging that I was able to share a little bit with him and sort of the team, his team was, man, if there's a way to use this energy for like what you're saying, like to feel that, to pump yourself up, right. That like, man, everybody there is wanting you to do well everybody there is so pumped up and excited and to kind of use that energy in a positive sense. I remember when Tiger was at his peak in his heyday, 
it was always so amazing to me how he could continue to perform with such high expectations. And I think that's why he was so mentally good and tough. Because you look at a lot of players that win a major, that kind of do something like that, they have a tough time sustaining that level of excellence, right? Whether it's they get to a certain point, now they feel that everybody expects them to do that every week, or now they feel, okay, I've got this five-year exemption, and now I can do something in my swing or my game that I've wanted to try to do to maybe even get a little bit better. And they struggle. And Tiger just seemed to always rise, right, when the expectations were high. And I always got the feeling that he just fed off the energy of the crowd because everybody that's there watching wanted to see him pull off the shot. I mean, 99% of the people wanted him to make the putt. They all wanted to see that happening, right? I think he could feel that and fed off of that and kind of use that internally to, to kind of help him, that energy. But you're right. I mean, that's kind of, and that was, I think, just the way he was trained. I think his dad trained him with the jiggling, the change and making noise and playing stuff and honking horns and, doing all this stuff because he wanted him just to be so focused. I mean, you know, you probably read stories of, of Ben Hogan that talked about that, you know, he made a hole in one on a par three somewhere. The story goes that he hit a shot, a real great shot on a par three somewhere. And someone asked him, man, Ben, how did you, how were you able to hit that shot with the train going by? And he goes, what train? So, I mean, some people just have the ability, the uncanny ability to focus so much on what they're doing and they're so into what they're doing that they don't even know what's going on around them, you know? Uh, and that's, uh, and that takes, you know, that, that's, that's not easy to do. And not that you have to do that, but it's more just that you're just, you're just into what you're doing. You're in the moment of what you're doing. And the other stuff is just kind of there at a lighter level. But that, as I love hearing you, when you talk about um, Lee, the training in chaos, and from my introduction to you was Reagan John, who was part of your pilot program there in Lehigh. I remember her talking about that, how that was a cool thing that she liked, was able to yes. kind of, practice that stuff in that mode helped her. It's interesting that you bring her up because, you know, that's really, you know, our connection um, as it related to, uh, I attended Lehigh University. I played football there back in the, the late 80s, early 90s, um, courtesy of, of Joe Sterrett, the, the present uh, AD and, and Julie Amory, who oversaw our pilot uh, project. I first met Reagan uh, intelligent, uh, I think, uh, Patriot League student athlete uh, of the year, um, Benjamin School uh, yeah. alumni, um, which I know you're also affiliated with. Mm -hmm. um, and when she first came to us, uh, she was very inquisitive by nature. And, and I think of the, 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 the nature of golf and the type of sport where you have your mechanics, you have your physicality. But again, there's that holistic investment in something more. And Reagan was very, uh, very much a student of what we taught her. Uh, she digested it very quickly. She implemented it into her practice uh, very deliberately, which is something that we also focus on uh, with our training protocols. When you were speaking of earlier, you were talking about using the energy. Um, it made me think of one of my earliest uh, research projects when I first decided to infuse mindfulness in the mindful athlete training protocol. I did a lot of study with John Kabat-Zinn, who most people now know is, is really one of the, the pioneers in this country, the introduction of mindfulness. And he has a quote that says, uh, in speaking of what it is to truly be mindful, to navigate with mindful purpose. He says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And I find that so apropos. Um, I actually thought for just a moment when you were talking about that in your advice to Tyler, I think Tyler has some surfing in his background, correct? I, I, I caught something. You know, he grew up on the ocean in Ponte Vedra and he right. loves surf. He's a very skilled surfer. I mean, it goes back to Bodie and Point Break. I think Tyler yeah. might be Bodie. I'm not quite sure, but I think you know, he, you know, he is. If he he's hasn't seen that movie yet, you got to tell him that's part of his homework from Mindful no, Athlete. I know he has, and I'm going to have to, next time we're together, we're going to have to gotta, force us to watch it again. But no, yeah. he's Tyler's a very old kind of a soul, that guy from a spiritual standpoint. So we really hit it off and always had deep conversations on that because I think as he's, figuring himself out navigating it he has been no, but he's an excellent surfer and it's funny he's had some of his really good tournaments at courses that are that are near an ocean and i always bring that up because that's so interesting yeah he's at dr this week which he finished second at in the fall 
they added that tournament because of COVID, but then it normally is this time of year opposite the, the world match play. Right. And so he's there now playing and he just loves that place. A lot of holes on the ocean. And when I was caddying for him and he got in, he Monday qualified in 2018 and played really well. All I kept saying is, man, this is your spot. This is your <laughs> spot. You got to feel like so at home getting to play at a course like this. Anytime he played anywhere like that, I always tried to you know get him in that, that feeling he has when he's out there surfing on the waves in the ocean. Now, there's a lot of application. I love that analogy. Because the enormity of the, the energy that, that emanates from the ocean is so much greater than us as human beings. We are often taken in by it. It consumes us. It's awestruck. Um, just one more little shout out to, to Point Break and, and Bodie, who I'm now officially going to refer to in my mind. Did Violet. you watch that last night? Was that like? <laughs> I, 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 I did really not. I swear I didn't. But I kind of have this this uh, savant type memory when it comes to moments like this. The culmination of that movie is that Bodie wants to go to Bell's Beach, Australia, to surf the fifty year storm. And what is so incredibly relevant about that, Josh, which is the exclamation point to what we're talking about, is one of the final scenes is that the whole world of surfers is really running from the beach where Bodie is just standing there waiting, picking his set sure. because he knows that they, this one opportunity to be uh, infused with this enormous amount of energy, there's something much greater than literally riding the wave. And I just find that so apropos for obviously what Tyler's trying to achieve, but also the, the, the overarching picture of what we're talking about here of, yes, there's a spiritual connection between mind and body. And anyone who's ever been in a flow state can certainly relate to that. That's why action and awareness tend to fuse. That's why our concept of time tends to get altered. Um, you and I, one of our first real uh, impactful conversations talked about, I think, an experience that you had when you first really started to engage in more meditative practices of your experiences of time on their course. Are there any other uh, experiences that you've had that you would really identify as more of that flow state or of that, that mind body uh, coherence? You know, I've had at different times feelings where I've, I've felt like pretty one with everything that's going on where there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, dissent going on between, between the mind and the body. I don't have any one, specific thing that comes perfectly to mind. I guess one time, one, one, one thing that I had that kind of happened that was interesting was I was in the US Open qualifier, the sectional qualifier when I qualified in 2009 at Beth Page Black. And in that second stage, which is the sectional qualifier, I played really good in the morning and made a hole in one on the 17th hole at Lake Nona and shot 66 and was rolling along in the afternoon. And I just remember feeling a little bit like uncomfortable and you know, your mind kind of wanders a little bit onto the results of doing it. I remember just thinking to myself was just like, I'm qualifying mm -hmm. because I put myself in this position and it's just going to happen. It was kind of like, this is happening. Weird, yeah, this is happening. I just kind of like, I played good in the morning. I'm playing well now. Like, it's just going to happen. We're going to find a way and had all kinds of wacky things happen. Like we somehow didn't have an umbrella. My cat, if you got to have an umbrella, it started raining. We're trying to keep everything dry or it was just all like a debacle, but I just didn't let anything like phase me, right? I made some key putts and ended up, you know, making a good par in the last hole and shot whatever I did in the afternoon round, maybe one or two under, ended up being medalist. But it was like a weird kind of a feeling where I just kind of had this thing. I've had, I've had that a few times where it's kind of, it's just going to happen. I had this another time at a mini tour event. I remember feeling like a little bit uncomfortable and I'm like, you know what? I'm getting this done. Like, I'm not letting that phase, like, I'm not letting that get in the way, I guess is what I could say, right? I just kind of just kept going through what I was doing and kind of stayed at that state and it, and it worked out well. So it's funny, like, sometimes when you're able to be in that mode, you're able to kind of almost take yourself out of yourself, I guess, right? You're almost able to look at it like more like I'm at like higher up in the air, right? Like, I, and, I, and I've, I've done that from just by studying of mindfulness sometimes to try to be a little more of the witness, right? The watcher and be up here. I've had some times where I felt that way at points where I have been successful. I've had times where I've been that way where it hasn't always worked out result wise. Right. I mean, I, I felt accomplished because I was able to do that, but those are two instances that I remember were very clear today. And I just kind of said, I'm just going to kind of keep doing my deal. I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to let myself get in the way. Does that make sense? I'm just going to 
this is gonna yeah, happen absolutely this is gonna happen you know so it gets me thinking too a lot of times our 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 verbiage is embrace the chaos and it's not avoid it it's not get overwhelmed by it it's embrace it so it's a it's the how you interact with the chaos it's the inevitability of chaos chaos is not something that we get to dictate when and how it comes to us it is going to come in some way and preparation helps prepare you for that right as well as when it does happen it's acknowledging of that yes I hit a bad shot. That doesn't mean it has to dictate the entire round. Yes, this is a big moment that it's not about underplaying. It's yes, it is, but it doesn't mean that you can't embrace that moment. It doesn't mean that you have to try to avoid that moment because by trying to avoid, you're giving all of that energy, all of those thoughts, those, those feelings versus just doing what you do really best. You're not going to be in a position to qualify for the U S open if you're not capable, right? If you're not able. And so it's putting yourself in that position to, to embrace that moment for yourself, to really embrace the chaos of life. No, I think that's great. And it reminds me of the quote that I always love that, you know, um, has something to do with, you know, kind of what we're wanting to do. And just like you're saying, you're going to have the chaos, you know, sort of uh, being courageous is not necessarily the absence of fear. Of fear. It's just being, knowing that you still got to go do what you got to do, right? You just kind of embrace it and move on your merry way. I, I kind of butchered that quote up, but it, has something to do with that that it's not that you're looking for to not have it you're going to have the feeling right but you just do what you got to do anyways right you just you push through you move on it's i think all perspective it's how you frame it it was really cool to watch i'll give another shout out to tyler so he plays at the players i'm watching him at the honda classic that golf course can be really tricky chaos happens left and right at, at dj national it's windy there's water everywhere guys shoot really high scores the first day i'm watching him He's a couple over par. He whips over to the 16th hole. And I just sensed a very calm, comfortable in his skin, Tyler. And I said, you know, this is really cool. He knew playing this week, this is what it was going to kind of be. He really hadn't hit many bad shots. I think he was two over. He made a double bogey on 11. He started in the back nine. But I just got to sense it. He was prepared for what this course is going to be, right? It's like he strapped it on like a backpack and was like, this is what it's going to be. It's not going to be easy. You have to make five and six footers for par. You're going to have to deal with some shots and get into bad spots. And that sort of attitude carried him all week. And he had a pretty solid week. He finished even par, finished about 30th. And that was very, very solid based on the way everything went that week. And I just noticed a little bit of a difference in him. And it was kind of like that mentality, right? You just kind of embrace what it is. You just kind of still go do what you do. You're not looking at it being like, oh man, like, situation like oh i'm over par now so i gotta make a birdie now i gotta force the issue here no no you just play golf you stick with your plan and you know that if you keep doing that it's going to work out at the end and so it's cool to see i can just see a sense of different energy and i think that the confidence he gained from handling himself so well at the players with the family there and that big moment and that big tournament i think is really going to help him and, and carry him forward Josh, when you, you speak of that, that application of that particular skill, uh, very often when you look at more of a traditional sports psychology ideology, there is the, the notion of mental skills. You, you, you yourself mentioned some of them earlier. There's that, that very strong emphasis of visualization when you think of, of the flight of a golf ball. There's that, that, uh, that imagery that you start to see those pictures in your mind. That is mental skills at its purest form. We like to say that the application of those mental skills in real chaotic time, that's the application of mental strength. And once you cross over from skills to strengths, that's really when your mental fitness starts to build. It starts to develop. I would agree completely. I love that language. I love the way you talk about that. And you're right. I mean, you can teach someone the mental skills to see and visualize and do that. But when you're able to actually do that in competition, when the going maybe gets tough, that really is what that is. Yeah. yeah like that, when you said Tyler, like literally strapped it on like a backpack, yeah. like it's, it's time. Like yeah. this is what I've thought about, right? It's, it's, it's that left brain to right to a degree yeah. Because the, the application of such, such does require a uh, purpose. It does require that linear aspect of what's needed of me as a golfer. But then there's also the, the more daring part. It's, it's, it's more risk-taking. That's the creative piece. Absolutely. Right? 
So no, what no, is it? Is. No, no, I, mean, I lo really love how you say that because, you know, being mentally strong and mentally tough is what separates the best golfers from the ones that aren't as good, right? Champion golfers from the ones that, that, that don't quite make it. And that is the key. That's the it separates key. the best from anyone, anything, 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 and whatever you're doing. Th thus life is a performance. I just find it interesting that when you speak of watching him do that, do you think that that is maturity? That's him being a little wiser. Is that more a commitment to his craft? Where does that holistic emphasis come from for Tyler? Yeah, it comes from the fact that he's been working on that. He's been working on, you know, keeping it simple, being the best competitor, giving best effort on every shot, understanding the value of that mental toughness, using adversity as a cue, like I've talked about, not getting rattled by things. So, yes, it's a maturity. It's doing it. It's the confidence and belief in yourself that if you, if you stick to those things, you'll get the result. And he's starting to have that now. He's right there basically on the cusp of, 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 of playing the tour and being in the top 125. If he hasn't already mathematically done it, he's right on the doorstep. And he's got a lot of the year left. So I think all of those things just kind of let you know, okay, this is, how, this is how I have to do it. And playing creatively, taking the risks at the right time, yeah, I mean, that is what that is. I think it's just you do it, you have some success in bigger moments by thinking and focusing on the right things and you begin to believe it. And that starts to build the mental strength. And then what guys like myself can do in helping Tyler and his team and his coaches and, and people that are helping with all these things is seeing if something changes a little bit and getting them back on this course, right? This is what you were doing when it was successful and just sort of just bringing him back to – his best space to be able to play his best golf and remember, Hey, this is what you're doing when it was going well. It's that level of awareness too. And I think as uh, professionals play more and more, they get to learn and understand those situations and those risk takers that we're talking about get to learn from those situations more often than the people who might, might play more on the timid side. And I think being able to learn from those experiences, being able to gain from those experiences and that awareness is really great. But when disruption happens, right? When things start to go wrong, sometimes it takes that cue from other people to bring back that awareness for us um, of understanding what we're capable of truly. Um, and I'm wondering, how do we as, how do you teach people who maybe don't have a caddy with them? Uh, and you're doing some coaching now, I believe. Like how do, how are you training them to be bringing that awareness of themselves, right? If it's just a group of guys going out for, for a game or, or if it's somebody who wants to play at a high level, but doesn't necessarily have that, that pro kind of vision, but still wants to be the best in their, their group. How do you teach them to bring that awareness maybe without that outside intervention uh, on the course? I think it just goes back to what you just said. It, the big piece is awareness, helping them to be aware of their self-talk being aware of their thoughts, being aware of their reaction to misses, being aware that they're going through their athletic shot process properly and they understand how to play, that their whole goal once they've gone through their thinking part of the routine where they've picked the club, like we talked about the left brain, they're seeing, they're feeling, and they're committing. And then they've got some questions they ask themselves after they hit the shot. Did they do that? And if they didn't answer no to any of them and they get right back to, okay, on the next one, I need to commit a little bit better. And just really talking to them a lot about like what that, what that means. I have a, I have a young girl that I'm, I'm helping coach on the mental side that plays college golf at FIU. And she's like a little sponge learning this. It's, it's so awesome. But we talk about just her awareness in all of these different aspects, right? And like what her self-talk is. And when, when she's practicing, we work very, very hard on her just kind of going through that whole process, right? Of just kind of accepting the shot, asking the question, okay, let's move on. Let's move on to another thing. And she actually is a very good match play player. So one thing that I give her is we got to find a way so that you have that mindset and match play and stroke play because most of golf is stroke play. So we come up with like a fun little game that I, I want you to almost kind of like within your group to play match play against the other, the other people in your group, the other two people you're playing. It's in your head, you're playing them in match play. So that kind of lets you be a little more aggressive. Results don't matter as much because you maybe can only lose a hole versus it making a seven or an eight counting. That kind of frees her up a little bit. And so she's kind of like that. But just finding little things, everybody's different, right? You find the different little keys that help certain people and you understand their 
tendencies. You understand kind of their personality. I, I, I use a, a assessments from a, a golf psych that kind of helped me kind of dive into what these players do. Um, and so that helps me just on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Josh, you, you mentioned, um, when you talk about your golf instruction, your, your, your ideology, your philosophy, that, that golf is not just about hitting great shots off the tee. You, you, you say that it's much more than that. It's about playing the game on the course. So tell sure. me more about that. What, what, what's really that about? Well, that kind of goes back to what I said, that you learn golf on a driving range. You learn golf on a tee. There's all this technology now. You learn to swing the golf club. I think that there's excellent, excellent coaches out there and teachers that know a ton about the swing. They know a ton about the data. They know everything about ball flight laws and launch conditions and angle of attack and all the stuff that's really important to hitting good golf shots. If you don't take that, though, and really help make sure someone is learning to play the game, that you're out there on the golf course watching them. I can't tell you how many times that I've taught someone where I'm teaching them swing things, we're on the range, we're doing some stuff. And then we go get on the golf course and I see something on the golf course that I never would have seen on the tee. Whether it's from how they set up and how they aim, you just for some reason don't see it on the tee. They're just able to do it on the driving range. But you get out on the golf course where it's different. It's now a hole, it's a flag different lies you see all of a sudden you're like wow like I see kind of like what you struggle with out here so there's just that blend that's really important to get on the golf course and be able to help players understand playing the game understand why it's important to picture hitting different types of shots understanding that why hitting different shots matters because you don't just like hit two perfect shots and oh that's golf I mean I was with a young kid on the golf course helping him he roasts the drive and we're talking about the strategy. Oh, yeah, I can't quite get there, but I like my two. And I'm like, all right, he rips the two iron. We get up there. He's now like in this edge of the rough by the bunker, no green to work with for the green. And he's now got to do all he can to hit this on the green and grind for a par. Where if the approach of strategy had been a little bit different, of maybe, you know what, to that flag, I got to hit it over here. Or I maybe hit like less of a club. But yes, I can't get to the green, but I'm going to lay back more. Then that's an easy shot. And he hit two perfect shots. And he's now over here scrambling his tail off to make a par. So that is what you see. That's playing golf, right? He did nothing wrong from a swing standpoint. Ripped drive, ripped his little two iron. But now he's struggling his tail off to make a par. I see that a lot with players. Just helping them understand looking at the golf course a little bit different. And that's what playing the game is. I think that old school players develop that first. And then they kind of learn their swing as they got a little bit older or got more skilled or got on tour because there was more access to better instruction or teachers or maybe they didn't have, right? Where they kind of have to figure it out. They kind of learned their swing maybe later. Now people really, really know their swing. So I'm trying to bring to the table, really helping players play the game. So I think that's where my statement means like that is I want to really help them play the game of golf and and look at it from all these different perspectives that you can use to kind of make, you know, give yourself some skills that help you off the course from learning to breathe properly. And, you know, what peak performance is all about. Josh, what you're really talking about is emotional intelligence. When I just listen to you discuss, it's almost as if you're training your, your golfers to have more of an intimate relationship with the golf course to understand how they might be, for lack of a better word, angry or, or happy that particular day, whether it's the placement of the pin, whether it's the elements, the real emotional intelligence that that's being taught from a peak performance standpoint is not only knowing yourself, it's also being mindful of being aware of being more present of your experiences from both past and future, not necessarily to exclude them, but to help you make better decisions in real time. Thus, as the emotional intelligence builds with an athlete, it's understanding that maybe you can put that club back in your bag and not rip it as far as you know you can to set yourself up. And again, of course, that's, that's experience, that's maturity, but a higher level of functioning that you're really talking about here is the emotional availability that that athlete can find in themselves and then apply that almost in the form of a relationship with the course that sure. they are playing. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is what golf is. It's you against the golf course. I mean, that's the game, right? I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's who you're playing and you're playing each course is different that you play. And, and that's, you know, that's the challenge is, you know, how well can you play that golf course? That really is what golf's about that in, in, in 
sort of a simple term, just kind of the opponent, right? It's you and the golf course, how well you can play, because you can't play defense on any other golfers, really aren't going to be able to impact them other than maybe your unflappable nature and that your confidence that you carry no matter when you hit a bad shot. So that might make someone go like, wow, we're not going to get this guy. Like he's rolling this week. But other than that, it's you and the golf course, how you manage that and how you do that. And so, you know, I like that term emotional intelligence. That's, that's what you're wanting to help players build and, and make stronger. Yeah. We were talking to somebody who sold, um, the golf simulators and he was talking about he installed it at some pga tour people and kind of heard the stories of it and how phil especially phil mickelson whenever he would get out driven uh he would always go for the big drive he would maybe pick up the bigger club um and maybe not always play his best shot right and trying to do that um and I feel like that's a very often thing of, oh, I can make, it's like the tin cup. I got the shot. I can, I can one up this person rather than just playing your own individual game. Sure. Do you see that a lot of people, like, especially when they're playing against different people or a course that they feel like they have to make up for, or they have to show up rather than playing with what they do best? No, you do. You see that, you see that happen. Absolutely. That happens. People get kind of caught up in someone else's game that I've got to be able to do that you know, length is always what people are going to want to do, right? They're going to want to bomb and rip it. And I think it's a fine line though. Like for Phil, man, he loves to be kind of swashbuckling. He loves to like send it and turn it loose. I think for him that he drives a lot of satisfaction from that, right? Other players, I think it can wreck their game. You know, they just, that's just not their style and that can mess them up when they get outside themselves. They've got to really play their game. So I think, again, it's very unique situationally, right? To based on the golf course or where you're playing. Some players, it's kind of fun to do that. It makes the game fun to try to hit driver to par four when that might not be the smartest shot, but that makes it fun for them. Like that's why they kind of like love playing the game. So for some players, I think it's fine to, to kind of do that. Other players, they've got to be very careful. They got to know their game and know that's. You're that's talking true. about good players. Good players can do that. <laughs> and then when you can't, <laughs> when you can't pull off that shot, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Josh, let's talk a little bit more just about what you're doing right now. Uh, personally, professionally, I know you've got your hands in a lot of things regarding sure. golf instruction, your school. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. Yeah, well, I've been, you know, the last about seven, eight years, I've been helping my dad run a couple golf courses in Hollywood, Florida, and kind of ebbed and flowed from some teaching and coaching golf at this facility. There is no driving range, so it's not as traditional, but it plays into the hand of me getting on the golf course and doing some on-course lessons. And obviously was caddying for Tyler, but since now that I'm not caddying full-time for him, I'm still helping my dad run these places, but for about the last four or five months, I've started to do a little more coaching at the Rick Smith Golf Performance Center, which is down at Doral in Miami. And so I've, I've, I've really seen a lot more uh, students. I'm doing a lot, a little bit more regular coaching and working with a lot of different players, but been able to, to work with some good players on sort of the game management side and the mental side. Rick and I have kind of been working together with some players that he's working with predominantly on the swing. I've come in to kind of help with the other stuff and kind of get to know their games. And that's been very satisfying for me because I really enjoy that. I'm still coaching the Benjamin girls golf team. Um, that's a fall sport in Florida. So it'll start up in August and goes for a couple months. And so that's always fun to help those players, you know, kind of get a little bit the most out of themselves and introduce them to some of these things. We don't have tons of time with them just because of their, they're such students at Benjamin uh, that we don't get them very much, but to be able to introduce some of these things to them is very helpful. But that's that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a South Florida guy burning the highways of 95 and the turnpike to go from the, the various facilities from, from West Palm down to Miami. But I've always driven my whole life being a golfer and growing up in Jackson, which is such a big city here from the beach to where I live, you're, you're driving a lot. So I'm used to it. I listen to put my podcast on or listen to the, my sports talk radio and kind of do my thing. But that's, but that's what I'm currently doing right now and look forward to developing some more programs down at Doral, um, some player development programs that I'm working on because it's such an amazing facility and just, just kind of rolling with that and, and just being there to kind of help people, help families, help parents, give a kid that wants to play golf at a high level a chance to. And even if he doesn't want to play golf at a high level, enjoying it. So, because golf's a game for life, you can play it forever, which is great. 
flights are real cheap now, Josh. So, you know, mindful athlete training does travel. We travel well. So I'm like, we're going to do, we have to do something down there. We have to do a little workshop. Well, you know, when you say Florida, you know, us uh, up here in the Northeast corridor, you know, we, uh, we like those, those, those words. So Absolutely. Um, anything you want to add? Uh, no, I, I, what's the best way to get in contact with you? If somebody wanted yeah, a lesson, yeah, no, absolutely. Just my website is my name, Josh That's probably the, the easiest way. Josh McCumber.com. I mean, I've got, I'm on social media. I've got a YouTube channel and I've got an Instagram. It's just all pretty much Josh McCumber at Josh McCumber. They can find me and, and see what I'm doing, uh, from, you know, my, my coaching and mm -hmm. I have, I, you know, I, I'm very blessed to have a, a, a wife of just over 15 years and two children that are 13 and 11 that are entering my oldest daughter's entering high school. My son's about to be in middle school. So this is a big transitional year for, for our family. So it's fun to spend as much time as I can with them while I'm, I'm busy doing my stuff. So, um, so it's good. It, it's good. But that's how the best way to find me. Just go to my website, joshmcumber.com. You can find me there, shoot me an email and anybody wants to learn more about what I do, you know, I'm happy to talk with them. Well, personally, Josh, I just want to thank you for your time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's guests like yourself that really give us a, a much higher level of credibility and where we're headed. Um, you know, the, the earlier stages of our, our path and, uh, thank you for, I know how busy you are of just taking sure. the time to you, you, the it's gentlemen like yourself that are like-minded that we're looking to align with more consistently. So aside from your time, your remarks, your, your thought process, it's really invaluable for us one, because it further validates uh, our line of thinking and what we think is the best way to help all athletes, uh, all individuals really under that blanket of, you know, life as a performance, but it also is, is, insightful for us to hear someone like yourself who's been competing who has done the highest level of achievement um because you know that's really an invaluable service for us so i thank you for that definitely uh, thanks guys that was fun to be on so we uh we will be in touch soon and don't be surprised if we if uh, you, you come out and you know uh you, you have a, a new trainee someday soon that uh <laughs> that needs to work on his swing just a little <laughs> Sounds great, guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank great, you. Great Josh. talking to you. All right. Sure. Take care. Have a good one.